Hi, my name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today I'm going to be reading to you the first few chapters of The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum, who was also the writer of The Wizard of Oz. But I love the story because I love these adventures. We're going to start off with the youth of Santa Claus, and the first chapter is called Burzi. Have you heard of the great forest of Burzi? Nurse used to sing of it when I was a child. She sang of the big tree trunks standing close together and their roots intertwined below the earth and their branches intertwining high above. Their rough coating of bark and queer gnarled limbs of the bushy foliage that roofed the entire forest save where the sunbeams found a path through where to the touch the ground in little spots and to cast weird and curious shadows over the mosses, the lichens, and the drifts of dried leaves. The forest of Burzee is mighty and grand and awesome to those who still beneath its shade. Coming from the sunlit meadows into its mazes, it seems at first gloomy, then pleasant, and afterwards filled with never-ending delights. For hundreds of years, it has flourished in all magnificence, the silence of its enclosure unbroken save by the chirp of busy chipmunks, the growling of wild beasts, and the songs of birds. Yet, Berzee has its inhabitants for all of this. Nature peopled it in the beginning with fairies, nooks, riles, and nymphs. As long as the forest stands, it will be a home a refuge, and a playground to those sweet immortals who revel undisturbed in its depths. Civilization has never yet reached Burzi. Will it ever? I wonder. Chapter 2. The Child of the Forest Once so long ago, our great-grandfathers could scarcely have heard it mentioned there lived within the forest of Burzi a wood nymph named Nasil. She was closely related to the mighty Queen Zerline, and her home was beneath the shade of a wide spreading oak. Once every year on budding day, when the trees put forth their new buds, Nasil held the golden chalice to, of Ak to the lips of the Queen, who drank therefrom to the prosperity of the forest. So you see, she was a nymph of some importance, and moreover, it said she was highly regarded because of her beauty and grace. When she was created, she could not have told. Queen Zerline could not have told. The great Ak himself could not have told. It was long ago when the world was new, and nymphs were needed to guard the forest and to minister to the wants of the young trees. Then, on some day not remembered, Nasil sprang into being, radiant, lovely, straight, and slim as a sapling she was created to guard. Her hair was the color that lines a chestnut burr. Her eyes were blue in the sunlight and purple in the shade. Her cheeks bloomed with a faint peak that edges the clouds at sunset. Her lips were full, red, and pouting and sweet. For costume, she adopted oak leaf green, all the wood nymphs dress in that color, and no one knows other so desirable. Her dainty feet were sandal clad, while her head remained bare of covering other than her silken tresses. Nasil's duties were few and simple. She kept hurtful weeds from growing beneath her trees and sapping the earth food required by her charges. She frightened away the gadogs, who took evil delight in flying against the tree trunks and wounding them, so that they drooped and died from their poisonous contact. In dry season, she carried water from the brooks and pools and moistened the roots of their thirsty dependents. That was the beginning. The weeds had now learned to avoid the forest where the wood nymphs dwelt. 
the loathsome gadgulls no longer dared come nigh. The trees had become old and sturdy and could bear the drought better than when they were freshly sprouted. So Nasil's duties were lessened and time grew laggard. While succeeding years became more tiresome and uneventful, the nymph's joyous spirit loved. Truly, the forest dwellers did not lack amusement. Each full moon they danced in the royal circle of the queen. There was also the Feast of Nuts, the Jubilee of Autumn Tintings, the Solemn Ceremony of Leaf Shedding, and the Reveille of butter Budding Day. But these periods of enjoyment were far apart and left many weary hours between. That a wood nymph should grow discontented was not thought of by Nasil's sisters. It came upon her only after many years of brooding. But once she had settled in her mind that life was irksome, she had no patience and to pass her days in ways hitherto undreamed by other forest nymphs. The law of the forest alone restrained her from going forth in search of adventure. While this mood lay heavy upon pretty Nasil, it chanced that the great auk visited the forest of Brzee and allowed the wood nymphs, as was their wont, to lie at his feet and listen to his words of wisdom that fell from his lips. Auk is the master woodsman of the world. He sees everything and knows more than the sons of men. That night, he held the queen's hand, for he loved the nymphs as a father loves his children. And Nasil lay at his feet with many of her sisters and earnestly hearkened to as he spoke. We live so happily, we fair ones in our forest glades, said Auk, stroking his grisly beard thoughtfully that we know nothing of the sorrow and misery that fall to the lot of these poor mortals that inhabit the open spaces of the earth. They are not of our race, it is true. Yet compassion well befits being so fairly favored as ourselves. Often as I pass by the dwelling of some suffering mortal, I am tempted to stop and banish the poor thing's misery. Yet suffering in moderation, is the natural law of mortals, and it is not our place to interfere with the law of nature. Nevertheless, said the fair queen, nodding her golden head at the master woodsman, it would not be in vain guess that Ock has often assisted these hapless mortals. Ock smiled. Sometimes, he replied, when they are very young, children, the mortals call them, I have stopped to rescue them from misery. The men and women I dare not interfere with, they must bear with the burdens nature has imposed upon them. But the helpless infants, the innocent children of men, have a right to be happy until they become full grown and are able to bear the trials of human. So I feel I am justified in assisting them. Not long ago, a year maybe, I found four poor children huddled in a wooden hut, slowly freezing to death. Their parents had gone to a neighboring village for food and had left a fire to warm these little ones when they were absent. But a storm arose and drifted the snow in their path, so they were long on the road. Meanwhile, the fire went out and the frost crept into the bones of the waiting children. Poor things! murmured the queen softly. What did you do? I called Nelko, bidding him fetch wood from my forest and, and breathe upon it till the fire blazed again and warmed the room where the little children lay. Then they ceased shivering and fell asleep until their parents came. Oh, I am glad you did this, said the good queen, beaming upon the master and the seal who had eagerly listened to every word, echoed in a whisper, I am glad too. And this very night, continued Ock, as I came to the edge of the Burzee, I heard a feeble cry, which I judge came from a human infant. I looked about me and found close to the forest a helpless babe 
lying white naked upon the grasses and wailing piteously not far away, screened by the force, crouched Shiegra, the lioness, intent upon devouring the infant for her evening meal. And what did you do, Ock? asked the queen breathlessly. Not much, being in a hurry to greet my nymphs, but I commanded Shiegra to lie close to the babe and to give her milk and to quiet its hunger. And I told her to send word through the forest to all beasts and reptiles that the child should go unharmed. I am glad you did that, said the good queen again in a tone of relief, but this time... Nasile did not echo her words, for the nymph, filled with a strange resolve, had suddenly stolen away from the group. Swiftly, her lithe form darted through the forest pass until she came to the edge of the mighty Burzee, where she gazed curiously about her. Never until now had she ventured so far from the law of the forest that had placed the nymphs in its innermost depths. Nacelle knew she was breaking the law, but the thought did not pause to her dainty feet. She had decided to see with her own eyes this infant Ock had told of them of, and that she had never beheld a child of man. All the immortals are full grown. There are no children among them, peering through the trees. Nacelle saw the child lying on the grass, but now it was sweetly sleeping having been comforted by the milk drawn from Shiegra. It was not old enough to know what peril means, and it did not feel hunger. It was content. Softly, the nymph stole to the side of the babe and knelt down to, upon the sward, her long robe of rose-leaf color spreading about her like a gossamer cloud. Her lovely countenance expressed curiosity and surprise, but most of all, a tender, womanly pity. The babe was newborn, chubby and pink. It was entirely helpless. While the nymph gazed, the infant opened its eyes, smiled upon her, and stretched out its two dimpled arms. In another instance, Nacelle had caught it up to her breast and was hurrying with it through the forest, pass as quickly as she could. Chapter 3. The Adoption The master woodsman suddenly rose with knitted brows. There is a strange presence in the forest, he declared. Then the queen and her nymphs turned and saw standing before them Nasile with the sleeping infant clasped tightly in her arms and a defiant look in her deep blue eyes. And thus for a moment they remained the nymphs filled with surprise and consternation, but the brow of the master woodsman, gradually clearing as he gazed intently upon the beautiful immortal who had willfully broken the law. Then the great Ock, to the wondrous of all, laid his hands softly on the sill's flowing locks and kissed her on her fair forehead. For the first time, Within my knowledge, said he, gently, a nymph has defied me and my laws, yet in my heart I can find no words of chiding. What is your desire, Nasil? Let me keep the child, she answered, beginning to tremble and falling on her knees in supplication. Here in the forest of Brzee, where the human race has never yet penetrated, asked Ock. Here, in the forest of Brzee, replied the nymph, boldly, it is my home, and I am weary for lack of occupation. Let me care for the babe. See how weak and helpless it is? Surely it cannot harm Brzee, nor the master woodsman of the world. But the law, child, the law, cried Ock sternly. The law is made by the master woodsman replied Nasile. If he bid care for the babe he himself has saved from death, who on all the world would oppose him? Queen Zerline, who had listened intently to the conversation, clapped her pretty hands gleefully at the nymph's answer. You 
are fairly trapped, O Ak, she exclaimed. Now, I pray you, give heed to Nasil's petition. The woodsman, as it was his habit, went in thought, stroked his grisly beard slowly. Then he said, She shall keep the bait, and I will give it my protection. But I warn you all that this is the first time I have relaxed the law, so it shall also be the last time. Nevermore, to the end of the world, shall a mortal be adopted by an immortal. Otherwise would we abandon our happy existence for one of trouble and anxiety. Good night, my nymphs. Then Ak was gone from their midst, and the seal hurried to her bower to rejoice over her newfound treasure. And that's where we end our tale for today. Until it be morrow.